So how did you get into philosophy? Well, the answer to that isn't terribly interesting. I had a high school teacher who was wonderful and taught philosophy, so it's not terribly exciting. Um, how I got into feminism is actually more interesting, um, which is that my grandmother um, started taking me to consciousness raising groups and on marches when I was about four oh, years wow. old. And so I, w I was raised with that. And then when I got to university, although I was into philosophy, I actually avoided feminist philosophy because I thought it was all really obvious. And <laughs> what I liked about philosophy was the puzzles. Okay. So I didn't really get into feminist philosophy until much later. I did a, a little bit of exploring with other grad students in a reading group. And then when I went on the job market, I listed it as an area of competence because I thought I'd quite like to become competent in it. And <laughs> then I was asked to teach it. So how would you characterize feminist philosophy? I would avoid characterizing <laughs> feminist philosophy. I, I, I actually find it really, really hard. I think it's interestingly hard mm. because I find it very hard to come up with a definition of it which includes all the things that should be included mm -hmm. um, because it's very diverse. But on the other hand, I do think there are some things that need to be ruled out as feminist philosophy and, um, and uh, as feminism, in fact. For example, you, know, you often get definitions um, in the popular press where you know, sort of anything that an individual woman finds personally empowering is feminism. Mm -hmm. So, you know... My expensive bubble bath is feminism, <laughs> right? You know, and, and I don't want to include that kind of um, But on the other hand, I want it to be quite open, and so I don't have a good definition. I think often when we have these like terms that are aiming this inclusion and equality for like large groups of people who are actually really diverse... Yeah, that that is really difficult to it's characterize. It's hard to, and, and yeah. I think it's, and it's not just the usual difficulty with definitions of philosophy, because of course it, things are hard to define. Mm -hmm. But when it's something like feminism, if you are excluding people and their concerns and their legitimate concerns, and you're doing a wrong as well, mm -hmm. you're not. It's not like you know, mm -hmm. having the wrong definition of heap or something. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps then, what is it to be a feminist philosopher? Sure. I, mean, I, I think so. I think there are. Um, so I run a blog called Feminist Philosophers, and one of the yeah. things I like about that is that there are at least two main meanings. Where one is that there are philosophers who are also feminists. Yeah. They might work on vagueness and never touch, you know, feminist philosophy, mm -hmm. but they might be personally feminists and really interested in feminist issues. Or people who do the subfield of the discipline called feminist philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think both of those are interesting and legitimate meanings for feminist philosophy. So, what gives you philosophical energy? What motivates your research nowadays? I just get angry about it and then <laughs> go off and write about it and I find it somewhat cathartic. Um, so what I'm working on a lot nowadays is racism and sexism in language. Mm -hmm. And um, you might be surprised to know that the world keeps handing me really interesting <laughs> examples to discuss. <laughs> I, I started out um, looking at sort of subtle racism in language it's like racist dog whistles mm -hmm. you know using words that are evocative of race without being explicit about it um, and I I was planning I had a year of research leave in 2016 and I thought oh there's an American election coming up so there'll be lots of subtle racism that's <laughs> awful <laughs> you knew that would happen well, yeah. <laughs> yeah well no I didn't I was wrong yeah there wasn't subtle racism yeah right? <laughs> so completely different research project which is how has this huge shift taken place where now somebody can get away with being so blatant yeah you know, it's not that the racism wasn't there before, but it had to be concealed in certain yeah. ways, and now it's not. It's, um, it's strange to find oneself looking back to sort of subtle expressions of racism as kind of a golden age when, you know, people at least knew they couldn't come out and say that stuff. Yeah. Um, so this is actually one of my research topics. And so one thing in the background that I think has played a role um, is remarkably after electing Obama, a lot of Americans um, came to believe that their vote for Obama meant that they weren't racist and didn't have to ever worry that they were racist anymore. Suspicious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what I've been more focused on is the use of a really interesting linguistic device that I name a big leaf that, that okay. Donald Trump uses. Like an Adam and Eve style. Yeah, it's, it's something which just barely covers a thing that you're not supposed to show in public. So a fig leaf, as I'm understanding it, is a, sort of an additional utterance that you either add on or say at the same time or sometimes say a while later 
that covers for what would otherwise be an obviously racist utterance. Mm -hmm. So when Donald Trump announced his candidacy, it was in a speech in which he said that Mexicans are rapists, but some of them I'm sure are good people. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of focus on him saying that Mexicans are rapists, as there should be, because this was an appalling thing to say. But what I became interested in was this other really weird bit that he added on, that some of them I'm sure are good people. And that serves as what I think of as a, a fig leaf, mm -hmm. in that it can reassure someone who's worried that this might be kind of a racist thing, Trump has said. There are other fig leaves in that utterance as well. So, for example, he doesn't actually say Mexicans are rapists. He talks about the Mexicans that are sent here and how they're rapists. And so that means that it's not just, it's not all Mexicans. Mm -hmm. Once people think to be a racist, you have to be against all members of group. But also adding on, but some of them I'm sure are good people, just to sort of a get out of jail card, right? But it you makes it look like maybe yeah. you just misspoke yeah, a little he, bit. He can't and... be racist because he said some of them are yeah. good people. And so I, I became curious about the role of that. So I, I spent some time looking at online discussion groups about Donald Trump um, amongst his followers, oh. Trump voters discussing whether or not he was racist. Yeah. And what's interesting is, first of all, that Trump voters, at least some of them, care about this and want to make sure he's not racist and spend mm -hmm. time online reassuring each other that he's not racist. So that suggests racism is still socially unacceptable, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's, we can't take that for granted these days, right? You know, they don't want to think of themselves as racist. And they were citing that and saying that it's not racist because he said some of them are good people. Mm -hmm. And he's not talking about all Mexicans, just the ones that are sent here. They're pointing those things out to each other. So they served as a kind of cover for what you and I see as a clearly racist message. Mm -hmm. It let them think, but is that okay? You know, I kind of feel like I'm alone with mm -hmm. them, but is it racist? Oh no, it's not racist because he said some of them are good people. Okay, I can go yeah. for You started in like quite subtle philosophy of language. Um, and things like that. Do you think there's much place anymore in like our current political and worldly climate for that kind of philosophy? Um, I don't think it's an interesting part of our political climate. I still think it's worth doing. I'm, I'm very much a pluralist about philosophy. I don't think there's just one kind of philosophy worth doing. And in fact, I think my training in that has really informed and helped me to be able to do the things that I do now. I had, you know, a lot of training that's helped me to sort of tediously break things down and think about them in a lot of pedantic detail, and it actually turns out to be illuminating, and so I don't, I feel like all of that is being used in what I'm doing now, and um, lots of the theoretical apparatus that was developed by philosophers who weren't doing political work turns out mm -hmm. to be really interesting when applied to the political work. So it's known, perhaps not well known, you and I know, <laughs> that the discipline uh, has issues. We have issues with sexual harassment, um, we have issues with retention of women students and students from other minority and marginalised backgrounds. Um, but it, that, that's not to mean that people aren't doing things about it. So I'm a member of Minorities in Philosophy, we try and do things at the student level, but then obviously you do and have done a lot of work with the Society for Women in Philosophy. And I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about that. Well, I think it's actually a significant advance that it now is pretty well known mm -hmm. that philosophy has these problems. When I was a grad student in the 90s, it really wasn't something that people talked about. I mean, mm -hmm. every now and then, I find myself talking to other women grad students. We talk about how scared we spoke. We felt to speak at seminars mm -hmm. and talk about what to do about it, but we never conceptualized it as a problem of philosophy. It was our own personal problems. Mm -hmm. And so just getting to the point where it is now, I think, widely known that philosophy has these problems. Not everyone agrees, but it's widely, mm -hmm. widely accepted. And there are are organizations like the Society for Women Philosophy, like MAP, which are trying to do something about this. And I think SWIP in the UK has worked particularly well with the British Philosophical Association to mm -hmm. come up with guidelines to improve the climate for women in philosophy and getting those guidelines adopted in lots of departments around the country. I think one of the most useful things about that has just been forcing it onto every department's agenda so that mm -hmm. they have to have discussions of it and think about <clears throat> it and talk about these issues, and that's really helped to raise awareness. Another project I've been involved with that I think has raised a lot of awareness um, didn't, it, it took a turn that I didn't plan or expect. I, I started the blog, What Is It Like to Be a Woman in Philosophy? Mm -hmm. um, and 
what I wanted was just sort of stories that might shed light on it because let's try to figure out why there's so few women. We want positive and negative stories. And what I got was this you know, massive deluge of stories of sexual harassment. And when it, it first started, I was planning them out for a week, sorry, for a day, two weeks in advance. So that's, that's the rate they were coming in at. Mm -hmm. It was like this fire hose of, of stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that shocked a lot of people in the discipline. It made them realize that there is a problem. So I guess um, then perhaps the ne next question is, do you feel optimistic about the discipline being able to overcome these challenges? Because there are still detractors and some very public ones yeah. trying yeah. to argue that there's not this retention problem, that sexual harassment isn't a problem, that professors should be able to date whoever they please without... Even arguing that women have it easier than men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that the measures that have already come in uh, making it harder on the people who are traditionally in the discipline already. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think to some extent, I think, and I think those voices have been very loud lately, mm -hmm. um, especially in certain regions of the internet that should remain nameless. Um, <laughs> but I think in part that's what you expect because backlash is a sign of success. Mm -hmm. I mean, anytime you make some progress, there's going to be an angry backlash. Mm -hmm. But I think there are a lot of people working to improve the discipline now. There's a lot that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And so because so many people are coming together to work on these issues, I'm quite optimistic about that. I'm worried about the fact that this is all taking place in a climate of austerity and cuts and increase in costs being passed on to students mm -hmm. and um, increase in casualization of academic labor. And I think all of that is something that makes it very hard to improve a discipline because there are lots of factors working to make it worse and mm -hmm. worse. And so I think we need to fight all of those things together. And what are some of the personal practices that you try and instill in your job, I guess? Like how you try and make the department feel, how you go about supervising. You're our director of graduate studies, yeah. so you have quite yeah. a big say on the graduate postgraduate experience in the department. Well... I've been thinking about that for a long time. <laughs> I actually really thought consciously about these things because I um, I was quite a my graduate school experience isn't one that I would like others to be repeating. Um, I, I was terrified to speak for five years. Um, it's not conducive to philosophy. No, no, yeah. it's really bad for philosophy. Um, and I and I really thought that this was just a personal failing of mine. And. Then when I became director of graduate studies for the first time here many years ago, I remember thinking, okay, what can I do to create a good atmosphere, a great comfortable place where students will flourish and all of this? And suddenly, when I thought about from that perspective, there are all these things that I somehow had failed to see as problems mm -hmm. that I, I was able to see quite clearly then. So, I mean, I had already started just because of the shift from Princeton to Sheffield. I noticed the enormous difference between viewing philosophy as an opportunity to destroy somebody mm -hmm. and viewing it as an opportunity to have a, a nice conversation. You know, mm -hmm. at, at Princeton, the goal always seemed to be to destroy the speaker. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was amazed just at my job talk here to have people ask me questions that, you know, sometimes there were you know, genuine clarifications. Sometimes someone would object to me and then somebody else would have a response to an objection. It was just, I, it never occurred to anybody to <laughs> do that. And, you know, there are people agreeing with me because they agreed with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so I realized, okay, that's what it's like if you're actually interested in the philosophy. Of course, not everything you're going to have to say is negative. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, it wasn't about the philosophy. It was about egos. Mm -hmm. right? So that's part of it. But, you know, I also somehow, it wasn't until I became DGS, it genuinely wasn't, that I realized it was a problem that at Princeton my DGS used to sit around the lounge talking to the grad students about who was stupid amongst the graduate students. I mean, I find it quite interesting, you're saying you couldn't see where the issues were with, at Princeton when you were yeah. in the middle of them. How do you think now that you can like overcome the same barrier when trying to see where the issues are for people who have like vastly different experiences to you. So our students are here from uh, places in the world where English isn't yeah. their first language, or our students of colour, LGBT students. The students who are more marginalised and where you're not necessarily going to know what the issues are that are affecting them. 
Yeah, I think it's a it's a huge epistemological issue how to do that. I mean, it's like there's no easy. I don't have an easy answer to that. Yeah. Right. And I want to pay attention to those issues. At the same time, I don't want to think that I've understood it and hold yeah. forth about what the right thing to do is. I mean, I think it's important to read and to listen. I think it's important not to just say, "Tell me, tell me what it's like." You're different from me. Explain. No, I mean, I, I think teach that's, me, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. On the other hand, you know, I, I want to create an environment where people feel comfortable coming with me, coming to me with their concerns. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to assume that that's going to capture all the things that I need to know about. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I'm trying to do is just to inform myself through reading lots of things, you know, both, mm -hmm. both things written by, you know, by philosophers, but you know, reading things online by people talking about their experiences, coming from different backgrounds in academia and mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, the things that are barriers for them. Mm -hmm. Do we have those barriers here? What are the things that help? Can we do those things that help? You know, so trying to do that so that I don't have to, you know, mm -hmm depend on the thought that people here will tell me what they need because I don't think people necessarily know. Mm -hmm. You have a child? I do. <laughs> you do? I've met them, they're great. And I was wondering, do you like consciously try and work your like feminist beliefs into your parenting? One of my, one of my proudest parenting moments was when um, he was really, he went through this really big Enid Blyton phase, which, mm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he was about seven years old, and he was reading some Enid Blyton out loud to me at bedtime. He suddenly stopped and stared at the page, and I thought, I thought he was stuck on a word, and instead he said very slowly, why don't the boys make their own f***ing sandwiches? <laughs> 